So welcome everybody. Thanks for being patient with us. Welcome to the October um, Winter Speaker Series event hosted by the Sioux Sitna River Coalition. Uh, before we get started, I would like to thank our sponsors with the Talkeetna Community Council, the Chase Community Council, as well as all the generous individual donors that make events like this possible. So today we're here to um, hear about Dave Braley's Juniper Creek Hydro Project. And to introduce Dave, I would like to pass off the microphone um, to Mike Wood, who is a board member of the Sioux Sitna River Coalition. So Mike. Thanks, Margaret. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. All right, all right. Well, hey, I, I'm at a Chase Community Council meeting and I have to join it, but I, I also had to introduce Dave. Um, so I'm really proud to introduce him because um, I first met Dave on the Susitna Hydro Project. And I don't think there's anyone out there that knows more or has spent more time on the Susitna River than Dave Braley. Um, he's gone back and forth across it multiple times doing his hydrology work. He got really close to this community. I worked with him a lot and he got used to the people that lived on this river. And um, so he understands the difference between huge hydro, big hydro and small hydro. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate his brain and his enthusiasm and, and what he has done with Juniper Creek. And um, I just wanna say that he has, um, he's worked with the community up here the susitna river coalition very much endorses this kind of renewable energy and small hydro innovations like he's done and uh we're a hundred percent behind that and he's even worked with miners like todd todd bauer up here on the susitna who's a friend of ours who who helped him with his road like he's really involved the community in this project and we couldn't be more proud of him uh, for what he has done. And, I, and, and um, we're very psyched that he's here tonight to talk with everybody about this for Susitna River Coalition. And um, I suspect the biggest hurdle isn't holding back a river, it's integrating into the politics of the power system. So anyhow, Dave, thanks so much for, for being here and doing this tonight for Susitna River Coalition. And hopefully more people will have a chance to watch this on Facebook. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Is it over to me, uh, Margaret? Okay, I'll hit. Uh, you go, buddy. Thanks, Mike. See you soon. See you, man. Screen share. All right, back to the beginning here. Okay, um, thanks, Mike and. Margaret for that great introduction and um, uh, here we go. Um, I, first off, uh, just a huge thank you to the Susitna River Coalition as I'm showing here in this slide. You guys were the only professional or non-governmental organization that endorsed this project. And when I first went to the municipality of Anchorage, uh, I gotta say that I, I had to get 14 state, federal, and uh, local permits to get to accomplish this project. And I gotta say the most difficult, the most challenging was the municipality of Anchorage uh, between the, the land use code uh, variances that I need to get and the conditional use permit. And when I first went to the city, uh, <clears throat> a senior planner there told me that the conditional use permit is like the hardest one we got and you don't have much of a chance of getting one. And um, uh, fortunately uh, that uh, planner retired and I was assigned uh, a new planner and in fact the, the head of the planning department and it, things got a lot better from that point on but they made it clear that uh, endorsements are important because uh, the people who decide whether or not you get a permit uh, from the city for either a 
variance to land use code or a conditional use permit, that's decided by commissioners, panels of commissioners. And those commissioners, uh, most of them probably don't have much experience in hydrology or in renewable energy. They might be architects or lawyers or um, accountants, whatever. And uh, so they rely on other people's advice as to whether these things are a good idea. And like I say, I, I went around to, as I've listed here below, uh, a number of non-governmental organizations and professional organizations, and all of them declined except for the Susitna River Coalition, uh, which is huge because one of the biggest battles that the Sioux River Coalition has faced was the Susitna Watana Dam, a, a large hydro project. And so for, for the Susitna River Coalition to be the one to have my back on this is, uh, is just huge. And I put a quote from Mike on the bottom here saying, we have to be for something and you can't be against everything. And uh, thank you so much. So um, here's where the project is located. Uh, we're kind of about uh, uh, one third of the way between Kinnick Arm over here and uh, Prince William Sound over here. The annual precipitation uh, in my project watershed is about 40 inches as compared to uh, 15 to 18, 18 inches here in Anchorage. Um, and I should point out that uh, there is another uh, hydro project, uh, three or four times the size of mine, just a few miles away. The South Fork of Eagle River has another run of river hydro uh, that's um, a really beautiful hydro that, uh, once again, run river. It doesn't have a dam, it doesn't uh, affect fish. Uh, and that hydro has been oper in operation since uh, 2013, I believe. This other prospect I've got shown here, Hunter Creek is not yet a hydro, but uh, that's another one that's been looked at. Um, and, uh, and again, sort of located uh, midway between Kinnick Arm and Prince William Sound. Uh, you can see that uh, I'm not quite in the biggest precipitation bullseye here of uh, Chugach State Park. You can see where all the glaciers are. A lot more precip up in these high mountains, a lot more precip down here by Girdwood, uh, the 20 mile river. There's a lot of other potential hydro opportunities, run a river hydro opportunities down there. Um, this is a uh, kind of a view from the east, uh, looking at uh, my side of the valley. Um, the Property is, uh, our property is, it's a uh, private property. It's an old homestead that uh, adjoins Chugat State Park. Um, the hydro intake is at almost 2000 foot elevation, um, which is, uh, and it's about 1500 vertical feet above the nearest uh, anadromous fish habitat, which is down here uh, on Eagle River. Uh, we're also about one mile horizontally away from Eagle River. Uh, as you can see, it's a residential subdivision uh, that adjoins the park. Uh, here's a closer up view um, of the project. Uh, and this uh, the yellow line here is approximately where the, the hydro penstock runs. Uh, it's uh, what I've shown here is it, this is a run of river hydro. So there's I have a spillway, but there is no dam. The dam doesn't back up, doesn't store any water. It's just enough of a uh, spillway to divert water into a pipeline or penstock that drops about uh, 370 feet uh, over a distance of about uh, 1,200 feet horizontal. And all the water we take out goes right back into this stream. So uh, these graphs I have shown here are hydrographs. It's water flow versus time. This is the kind of the summer peak flow here. And I'm showing that uh, the hydrograph, the amount of water in the creek is the same above our intake as it is below the intake. Uh, so if you were a fish down here, uh, you wouldn't really know. Of course, there aren't any fish uh, in this creek. I'll go back to the previous slide. Uh, and you can see that because the elevation difference here, 1500 feet here versus 400 feet, there's, there's really no way a fish, fish can migrate up that steep of a gradient. So uh, again, run a river hydro, 
Um, the other good thing about this location is that we have, so we are taking water out of the creek here at the intake. Uh, we are diminishing the flow in what's called the bypass reach here. But the good news is there's another tributary, Falling Water Creek, that enters this uh, bypass reach uh, between the intake and the outfall. So we're putting water back, or falling water is naturally putting water back into the creek. Um, and also uh, there's more water coming in via springs. And you can see from this photo that there's a kind of a noticeable vegetation change from uh, these tall cottonwood trees up on this knob here, kind of everything drops down into sort of a dense alder gorge. And uh, these next photos show that change. This is a, a, must be a September photo that shows the deciduous trees in yellow and here's all that alder. Uh, our intake is about right here. So this change in vegetation happens right around our intake level. If you look on this picture, you can see the vegetation change again. You can see uh, these lines through the alders. Uh, those are spring drainages, kind of that come out of the ground at this level. You can see them down here in the late spring, a little bit of snow on the ground. You can see these springs coming out. And uh, here's a nice picture. This picture is taken over by the intake. So it would be over uh, right about here. And you can see this massive spring. This, this, this is Juniper Creek. And this is a spring uh, that just rockets out of the ground. Uh, this picture right here was taken uh, this summer. Oops. Looks like I did something here. I got to go back. Uh, so this was taken in the summer, probably August 1st. And um, it probably had three or four cubic feet per second coming right out of the ground, uh, just about right here. So a really unique uh, location. Um, this change in vegetation, the change in the groundwater discharge, that's an indication that something's going on with the geology. And it turns out here that actually there is a bedrock thrust fault passing right through, I lost my pointer here, but the uh, thrust fault, the bedrock fault passes right through the hydro. And uh, basically that thrust fault separates uh, these higher mountains on the right, uh, which are underlain by a, a more resistant rock type called the McHugh complex. And those mountain peaks are two or 3,000 foot higher than uh, the mountain peaks uh, closer to Kinnick Arm, which is under an by Shaley Rock. So these changes in water flow and mountain elevation are caused by geology. Uh, and this is sort of a uh, schematic of what I think might be going on uh, in the underground that's forcing the water. Basically, this the cover over bedrock thins where this slope gets uh, steeper and the uh, um, water daylights to the surface. And that's what you're seeing here with this, this big spring. So this is a view of uh, the watershed. Uh, so the watershed here, um, the entire drainage area is above 2,000 feet and uh, extends in elevation up to about five or uh, actually six or 7,000 feet. Uh, can't make my pointer. Oh, here's my pointer. Yeah, so this is Raina Peak. That's about 7,000 feet. And there's other big boys over here, Kiliak and Korahusk in that same range. Um, you can see that there's a couple of uh, uh, dying glaciers in the watershed. I've outlined them here in red. Uh, and you can actually see them a little bit better here. This is sort of the same view in a false cover color. Uh, this is actually LIDAR topography, but you can see the, the Ram Valley Glacier here uh, is mostly covered with dirt, uh, but you can see in the, the upper reaches, there's my pointer. It's got a few little supraglacial ponds here. The, 
the dirt cover sort of thins as you go up the glacier and there's actually blue ice exposed up here at uh, Bombardment Pass. Um, this other glacier underneath uh, Mount Peking, this is Mount Peking right here. Uh, this is almost completely covered with dirt, a little bit of perennial snowfield up here. Um, but these are both uh, basically stagnant glaciers. And so a, one of the things I worried about when I was first um, looking at this project was, well, is the water flow that we're seeing here, is that the result of a dying glacier that's gonna be gone and the water's gonna go away? Or is it not that? And so fortunately, um, we have uh, a really brilliant scientist at the US Geological Survey in Anchorage, Janet Coran. She's, uh, she's had a very distinguished career and worked all over the state of Alaska. And she did a very nice study here of the Susitna Valley where she looked at uh, stream flow hydrographs. So these graphs are the annual flow hydrographs for uh, several different Susitna Valley streams. And she's uh, distinguished them here between glacier melt streams uh, that have this sort of uh, round back hydrograph that has sort of the peak flow is in July. Um, and that contrasts with uh, snowmelt hydrograph, which you tend to have a, a sharp peak in uh, May or June. Uh, and these streams, the Deshka and Montana Creek, of course, they have their late fall uh, rainfall peak. So um, here is Juniper Creek. You can see that uh, it doesn't have the rounded hump that the glacier melt streams like Eagle River have. Uh, instead, it's got this in my case, it's sort of delayed. We don't really see this peak flow until about July 1st, but it's, this is a snow melt peak. Um, it's delayed because a lot of the water has to flow underground before it uh, daylights. And then we have a uh, declining flow into the fall. And the other nice thing about this hydrograph is uh, it's got this really nice long recession tail in the, uh, throughout the winter. So that's, you see these other streams, they, send to, they tend to fall off quicker in the fall and more of a flat um, winter hydrograph, whereas we sort of get the prolonged benefit of these springs going throughout the winter. Um, one of the issues too was, well, like, gosh, you know, how, how do you measure a creek like this to figure out how much water's in it and how much power's there? You can see that, uh, there, it's extremely turbulent, uh, supercritical flow. If you've ever seen guys out trying to measure uh, river flow with a current meter, they're usually standing in waders in, in water and using a little meter uh, to measure the flow. And that just doesn't work here. You can't submerge the thing underwater and the flow is too turbulent to be able to use a uh, current meter. So after re some research, uh, found that uh, a pretty good way of measuring flow in a stream like this is uh, uh, with the uh, dilution, dye dilution. Uh, you can also do these measurements uh, with salt, but uh, you know, where you dump a slug of salt into the creek, you measure this uh, concentration current going by and you can determine the discharge from that. Uh, the problem with salt is that uh, it takes a lot of it um, there's, uh, and you measure salt with um, a conductivity meter and there's background conductivity. So you kind of have a background problem. You have sort of a dosing problem and then you have toxicity because salt is toxic to fish and other creatures in high enough concentration. So uh, this uh, fluorometer, Swiss made fluorometer that I found was able to measure dye uh, down in the part per billion range here, about 30 parts per billion is the sort of uh, peak level that you're looking at here. And although dyes, fluorescent dyes do have toxicity to fish, it's at a much higher concentration, like a thousand times higher. So uh, I was able to use this instrument to measure flow pretty accurately. You see here from this measurement, the standard deviation of these three repeated measurements was less than 1%. So that's actually quite a bit better than you can get with a current meter. And this is uh, the rating curve that we use to um, translate flow measurements into continuous stream flow data. 
And you can see that the data all kind of fits this curve pretty nicely. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, streamflow measurement data that uh, uh, I use to evaluate power production and to apply for the water rights. And you can see this uh, run a river hydro here. Uh, we're using uh, about one third to one half of the summer flow, depending on the year. Uh, this red line is uh, how much water we're using for the power production. It looks like here we're using all the water uh, that goes through the spillway, but in fact, uh, you can see here, these pictures are from uh, about a week ago and we do spill. Uh, it's advantageous for us to spill a little bit of water over the spillway just to help maintain our level. And because of all the uh, springs that come out of the ground nearby, here you can see this photo on the right is taken just a little ways below the spillway. And here's this waterfall uh, still running, even though we're uh, diverting almost all the water into the penstock. And this uh, bottom photograph here is uh, last week, um, farther down in the bypass reach, uh, closer to the uh, powerhouse. Uh, so that's what it looks like in the winter when we're taking almost all the water. In the summertime, uh, the creek's pretty much running uh, free. These springs, uh, th these photos were taken when the hydro is running. So we're letting you know a half to two thirds of the water go by. So there's, uh, uh, that's kind of the nature of Run River Hydro. You, uh, it doesn't take all the water in the stream. And unfortunately in our case, we have this other tributary that comes in and uh, replenishes the bypass reach also. Um, some of the hydro components, um, the spillway here, uh, we built using steel sheet pile. Uh, and we did this during the very low flow in the spring. We constructed this uh, diversion pipeline here with sandbags up at the top to divert the water around the construction site. And the goal there was to prevent sediment from being taken downstream and uh, potentially impacting downstream resources. So that was all done. All of our in-stream work was done uh, before the 1st of July when uh, or actually before the middle of June. So this, this work here is you're looking at uh, actually is probably mid-May. So most all this work is done uh, before the flow comes up in an effort to uh, not impact salmon spawning down on Eagle River a, a mile down uh, below us. Uh, so that's the spillway installation. Uh, this is the uh, completed spillway uh, with this, uh, stainless steel Kalanda screen that you see here. Uh, the Kalanda screen is really kind of a beautiful thing because it, uh, it keeps out any sediment that's larger than one millimeter. So that's about the size of medium sand. It prevents particles larger that, than that from entering uh, the penstock. And it also keeps uh, debris, sticks, leaves, and uh, importantly, uh, critters are not able to be sucked into this intake. And there's, um, there's not, of course, there's no fish uh, in this creek, but um, there's birds. We have American dippers uh, or water oozels, uh, at least one pair that uses this reach of stream. They're incredible birds and they perch on this uh, beam here that I got across the spillway and they swim in this pool, they dive underwater, and uh, they're just amazing birds. So uh, this is the Coanda screen. The Coanda effect, uh, Coanda screen basically makes use of the same thing that happens with uh, airplane wings, is that if you have a jet, a fluid jet that's next to a, uh, a solid surface, the jet's gonna align itself with the service, surface, or it's gonna adhere to the surface, and these uh, fluid jets adhere even better if it's a curved surface. And that's, that's why we have the shape of airplane wings uh, are used to create the lift um, due to this Coanda effect. Uh, so this is a, uh, an example of, so all the Coanda screens have like a uh, 
this is called the accelerator plate up on the top here, which uh, accelerates the flow, changes it to supercritical, and draws the water over the screen uh, where it can be uh, filtered of sediment and debris. Uh, one thing about the Coanda is that you can imagine this stainless steel surface here, if it was exposed to the sky, night sky, you'd have ice formation on it. And so what we've done here is to make an insulated cover over the stream, over the Coanda screen, and that has proved uh, effective at preventing ice formation on the screen. Uh, the penstock or the you know pipeline that the water flows through is a combination of this high density polyethylene here. This is an 18 inch diameter pipe. This stuff, this pipe comes in 50 foot lengths. So uh, it was a bit of a challenge to get the, this 1200 feet of this uh, plastic pipe up to the property. Uh, we kind of built a custom trailer to uh, haul this stuff up on a, uh, behind a, a loader. And then we used a uh, helicopter from Big Lake, uh, Northern Pioneer Helicopters. Uh, they slung uh, all this pipe uh, into three different stations where we welded it together using this welding machine. So basically we weld another 50 foot stick onto the end here and used a bulldozer to pull it downhill and weld another stick on. We did have one section of really uh, sort of a steep cliffy part right here that you can see on the right. And uh, here we have bedrock, you can see at the bottom of the photograph. So we were not, um, one thing about the plastic, this, the plastic pipe is that it has to be buried underground. So this photograph, we haven't buried it yet. Um, the steel pipe, or in this section on to the right here, uh, bedrock prevented us from being able to bury the pipe. So we had to use steel. So we've got 80 feet of uh, coated steel pipe. Um, and this photo that you're looking at right here is where we've landed it on some wooden cradles. We landed it with a helicopter uh, on the cradles where it was supposed to go. And then we uh, uh, built uh, thrust blocks. Actually, these a thrust block is basically an anchor that holds the pipe down uh, keeps it from jerking out of place due to the uh, momentum of the water. If you have water going through a pipe around a bend, it's going to create a force that wants to, in this case, lift the pipe off the ground. So here we uh, use the uh, bedrock. Um, here we drilled bolts into the bedrock and epoxied these uh, bolts into the rock and, and set it all in concrete to, to hold the penstock in place. Uh, other important part is the powerhouse. Uh, these are a couple pictures of the uh, powerhouse foundation going in. Uh, we had a number of uh, concrete pours to uh, get this up to grade. And um, just a couple pictures of this. Um, and after we had the foundation in place, uh, we worked out a way of hauling the 5,000 pound generator, which is in the upper left here. I'm sorry, the turbine is 5,000 pounds. Uh, haul that down the hill on another custom designed trailer uh, behind an excavator. And the generator here on the right hand photograph, this thing weighed 8,000 pounds. So it was uh, quite of a feat to get this equipment uh, down the hill. And uh, you can see here the metal powerhouse building that went up uh, around the uh, equipment here. Uh, the turbine is, uh, uh, the turbine was built by Canyon, Canyon Industries in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, this is kind of a plan view of the turbine design. This is called a Turgo turbine. It's got uh, two jets that spray water at a wheel that uh, looks like this, and it's called a runner. And uh, the, so these uh, jets, which you can't see in this photo, but the jets spray about a three inch stream of water at this, at this wheel. And the, these, uh, these things are called buckets and they're designed to uh, reverse the momentum of the water by exactly 180 degrees. So 
it's a pretty, uh, pretty amazing design. Um, there's different types of turbines. Uh, mine, like I said, is a turgo here. This is a graph of uh, flow on the horizontal versus head on the vertical. And you can see that you probably heard of uh, Pelton turbines are uh, commonly used in hydros. You can see that those are good for very high head situation. Uh, when you have low head, you're onto these other types of turbines. And this is my uh, turgo, which kind of fits right in here. So I'm kind of an intermediate um, uh, head and flow. And again, there's the, the runner. Uh, this is the uh, switchgear installation, uh, the controls in the switchgear. These were built, uh, the control module over here, this was built by a guy named Dan Batdorf in Redding, California. Brilliant man. So this uh, box here controls hydraulics, which uh, tell the jets to open and close and control how much water goes through the, through the turbine. Uh, the switch gear has a bunch of uh, safety equipment. Well, safety and uh, quality, power quality equipment that basically regulates the voltage, frequency, synchronization, power factor, a whole bunch of uh, electrical criteria that uh, we need to have so that the power is uh, safe and reliable and can be consistently uh, uh, integrated with the, the power grid. So uh, all this equipment, the switch gear and the controls uh, were built in California. The turbine was built in Washington. The generator uh, is kind of the only big piece that came from outside of the United States. Uh, and that was built by uh, Morelli in uh, Italy. Uh, another big component of the system is the, the power line. Uh, this uh, view on the left is from the top of our overhead section. Uh, uh, we, we have a total of three power poles. There's about a 250 foot horizontal span and then about a 500 foot uh, downhill span. You see on the right here. And uh, we elected to use uh, radio uh, communications for um, both of our internet lines. We have two independent internet connections. Uh, one is dedicated solely to Matanuska Electric Association, so they have the ability to shut off the power if anything's not right with uh, voltage, frequency, synchronization, etc. Uh, and we have our own uh, uh, internet connection so that we can also monitor and control the system from our side. Uh, and these radios are both uh, solar powered. Uh, the batteries for the solar system are underground to try to capture ground heat to keep the batteries warm uh, in the winter when uh, battery temperature can be a problem. Uh, in addition to the 800 feet of overhead, we've got 1,600 feet of underground power line. Uh, 1,300 feet of that is permanently owned by Matanuska Electric, even though we paid for it all. Uh, and this equipment that you see here, this is all owned by Matanuska Electric. We bought it, uh, but this is their communications uh, receiver here. This is the power metering uh, station. And uh, these other, uh, this is a transformer for MEA to have power to run their equipment. And this is a disconnect switch uh, to be able to manually shut off power. Uh, we also paid for uh, the entire electrical system design, the power line design, uh, and, and an interconnect study so that uh, MEA could be assured that there weren't going to be problems with overloading their system. Uh, and as a result of this interconnect study, that's what basically uh, determined the size of our system. It turns out that we actually have more creek power than uh, the grid system is able to accommodate here because um, the local grid uh, 
in the subdivision here is only a single phase system. It doesn't have the closest three phase service, which is where you see the three or four overhead conductors that the closest three phase is down at the bottom of the valley, more than a mile away. And so we had to limit our power production to the capacity of the single phase system, which was uh, 300 kilowatts. Uh, so how do we pay for all this? Um, we did apply for back when the state of Alaska had money uh, in the early uh, teens, 20 teens, uh, we applied for grant funding from the Alaska Renewable Energy Grant Fund. We were denied uh, both times. Um, and also because we were located in the municipality of Anchorage, we were not eligible for the uh, USDA rural assistance grants that paid for uh, up to 25% of uh, solar farms, uh, uh, Alaska solar farms in Fairbanks and in Willow. Um, we sought help from the Renewable Energy Alaska Project uh, and their advice available. Uh, and uh, we also asked REAP for help uh, negotiating our power purchase agreement, but they, uh, the best advice that they could give us was to hire a lawyer. So we didn't get any help from them. Um, so basically, uh, what we relied upon for financing was our, our own personal retirement accounts. Uh, and we based our uh, revenue projections on uh, regulatory forecast filings that are required by Alaska law. All, uh, Alaska utilities are required to forecast their uh, avoided costs, which is what uh, utilities pay to independent power producers like us. Uh, and you can see here that in 2016, the forecasted avoided costs for Matanuska Electric, uh, back in 2016, they were forecasting about 10 cents per kilowatt hour for their avoided costs. That's the cost that they would pay uh, for this project. Um, it turns out that that hasn't really worked out. Uh, the current uh, avoided costs that MEA uh, is paying just this new quarter is about uh, 7.3 cents per kilowatt hour. And we don't really have an explanation from them as to why the cost dropped so much. The, most of this change occurred within the last year. Um, they haven't explained it to us. Uh, the best that I can guess is that they've negotiated better gas purchase agreements with uh, Hillcorp and other Cook Inlet operators that make their gas costs cheaper. Because basically almost all the cost you're seeing here, almost all of MEA's avoided cost is the cost of natural gas. Um, you know, seeking to improve our economics a little bit, uh, we tried to seek payment for uh, what's called capacity. Uh, Alaska law allows uh, payments to uh, independent power producers like us for both energy, which is kind of the cost of fuel and capacity. It's right here in the law. Uh, MEA charges their customers for capacity using their demand charge, which is uh, currently $7.70 per kilowatt. This would have added 15% uh, to our bottom line, but uh, unlike almost, uh, I can't say the entire lower 48, but a good portion of lower 48 uh, gets paid for capacity, uh, but here in Alaska, nobody, no independent power producer has ever been paid for capacity. And uh, within the last uh, decade, uh, the rail belt utilities have built about 30 to 50% more gas fired generation capacity than we need. And as a result, uh, MEA insists that our capacity isn't worth anything. And so we're not getting paid for it. Um, uh, we also tried to introduce, uh, you know, building on uh, Chugach Electric's uh, attempt in 2018 and 2019 to introduce a, a green power program. We uh, tried to introduce a green power bylaw amendment uh, to MEA. This was based on, uh, here I show this, gra this graph as a, the 2018 MEA member survey showing that 
most of them in uh, 2018, it was 70% of MEA members thought they should receive more power from renewables. Uh, I believe that number as of last year was up to more than 80%. Uh, and as the right-hand graph shows here that at least some MEA members were willing to uh, pay for it. Uh, and that's basically the premise of these uh, voluntary uh, green power programs. Um, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska in their review of Chugach Electric's proposed green power program uh, said that these would be approved as long as they're completely voluntary. In other words, uh, no one is forced to pay extra for renewables. It's only if they want to. Um, very similar to MEA's voluntary charitable giving program called Roundup, that they basically give uh, uh, excess money from people's electric bills to charitable causes of their choice. Uh, there's a lot of uh, lower 48 utilities that do have tariff or green energy programs that are actually part of their tariff. So those, those are not voluntary if they're part of the tariff. So you see some, some of these uh, utilities uh, pay an additional five cents per kilowatt hour. There's several here at three cents, two cents per kilowatt hour. And, and this list was developed by uh, one of um, the, uh, uh, this was for the Chugach Electric's proposed green power program. It, it wasn't one of Chugach's experts. It was an expert hired by the uh, state of Alaska. And this was a list in, uh, in an, a partial list in 2018 of lower 48 utilities that offer this sort of program. Um, we uh, suggested a bylaw amendment to, to MEA uh, based on RCA's, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska's uh, opinion that, uh, or condition that it ought to be completely voluntary uh, and that uh, uh, the Regulatory Commission suggested using Golden Valley Electric's uh, SNAP program that stands for Sustainable Natural Alternative Power. That program has been in place since about 2003, I believe. And we uh, basically just uh, suggested changing the names here. Uh, and this is a tariff document. This is from Golden Valley Electric's tariff. And we submitted this to the MEA board in a, in a special board meeting in 2019, March 6, 2019. Uh, at that meeting, uh, MEA's chief executive officer said they could, they would be able to evaluate a program like this within as little as three months time. Their corporate financial officer said that he saw the numbers, which I've got shown here. Well, this is basically the fund growth. If we took uh, this pie chart here of how much of MEA's members uh, uh, indicating how much that they would contribute per month, just taking these raw numbers, plugging them into a spreadsheet. This is the growth of money that would accumulate if people contributed money like this. And this is uh, basically the uh, uh, value of investment that uh, could be offered to independent power producers. Um, it, like I said, the corporate financial officer said he saw the numbers, but the, and the chief executive officer said they could evaluate it. But uh, during the special board meeting, uh, the board uh, killed this uh, proposed bylaw amendment. Uh, they said that they would, uh, you know, continue to evaluate it. Uh, but the, uh, the current board president said that this was a poorly thought out uh, program that uh, I had presented to them. And that uh, another quote from our, our current uh, MEA vice president on the board said, the last thing we need is another damn project. So uh, since that time, uh, March of 2019, uh, no alternative power program has been developed and they haven't documented any progress on uh, the better program that they're developing. And meanwhile, uh, we have uh, MEA members within my surface service area that are sending monthly payments to uh, re renewable energy producers in the lower 48. And uh, the only thing that's standing in the way from Alaska independent producers or 
uh, independent power producers from receiving this kind of support is the utility. They said that uh, they don't want it. So uh, this slide is from uh, a, uh, an MEA uh, special board meeting presentation that's on their website, March, 2021, their carbon reduction goals. Uh, you've probably heard their uh, uh, advertisements on the radio saying that MEA is committed to reducing their carbon emissions by 28% by 2030. Well, if you look at this uh, asterisk here, it's, that's compared to 2012. And so really down on the bottom of the graph here, uh, and I didn't make this up, this is from the MEA website, their forecasted emissions for 2021 uh, they've forecasting that they've already got a 27% reduction. So all they're looking at reducing between now and 2030 is just 1%. So I think what you're hearing on the radio is, uh, uh, is maybe inaccurate. Um, they also on their website say that they estimate a 3% reduction in fossil fuel generation in 2021 due to available hydro generation resources. I know that's not me because uh, our contribution is much less than 3% of their demand. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, when MLNP was transferred to Chugach Electric, somehow MEA has acquired a hydroelectric system that's integral to the Anchorage Water Wastewater Utilities uh, water system. And this came at uh, no cost to MEA. So uh, bottom line here is that MEA's website their rate and the radio ads take credit for carbon reductions when they really aren't doing anything and they really don't plan to reduce emissions uh, any more than 1% between now and uh, 2030. Uh, an additional thing, you know, MEA is a cooperative. It's owned by the members and uh, they have a set of organizing principles, which uh, they seem to have taken off their website, uh, but they do still claim that they're led by their members. So here we have a situation where member surveys clearly support renewable energy, but the MEA board and management are working against the membership by targeting emissions reductions that they've already achieved, right? They're already at 27% uh, reduction. They say they're only going to make 28 by 2030. They've been denying capacity payments to our project and to other independent power producers that are allowed under Alaska law. They've been slow walking the green water, the green power program that we introduced three years ago. And in addition, uh, they have demanded in our power purchase agreement and in the other power purchase agreements for the Willow Solar Project, they demand that MEA gets 50% of the renewable energy credits uh, for the project, which uh, right now aren't worth anything here in Alaska, uh, but uh, potentially when uh, we have a renewable portfolio standard, uh, these things are gonna be worth money, but the only way that MEA would sign our purchase agreement was if they got half the credit for it, even though they, the way it works, uh, uh, with independent power projects like mine is that we can't cause any increased cost to members. So all of the costs of this project were paid by us, including all of MEA's engineering costs, their interconnection costs and integration costs. So they're not really supporting renewables and they're not really following their members' desires. Uh, MEA is just one of the rail belt utilities and their actions together with government support for Cook Inlet grass drilling is the reason that we have not had any meaningful development of South Central's world-class tidal geothermal hydroelectric resources uh, and wind resources in the last decade, despite the fact that we have a shovel-ready project in the form of fire on phase two. Uh, my takeaway is at this time, Alaska Rail Belt Utilities, they don't want renewable energy and we don't really have any way to encourage them to move forward. So things need to change. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dave. That's 
it's super inspiring to listen to how you kept the project going and really discouraging to hear about all the roadblocks that got tossed up in front of you. <laughs> um, and we do have some, a bunch of questions from folks. Um, one being, what is the maintenance cost of something like this for you guys? Thanks. Um, can you hear me answer? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, um, hydros are amazingly uh, low maintenance. Uh, this system that uh, I've shown you the pictures of here, basically what needs to happen for maintenance is um, lubrication. Lubrication of the turbine bearings, lubrication of the uh, hydraulic fittings, um, and uh, the major maintenance that will happen down the road will be replacement of the turbine bearings. Well, there's oil change, okay? There's an oil change about once per year. There'll be an annual inspection where we shut everything down. We check everything, uh, change the oil in the uh, turbine bearings. Um, and after about 10 years, we'll need to replace the generator bearings. And after uh, perhaps 25 years, we'll have to replace that uh, beautiful stainless steel runner that you saw. Uh, the generator is expected to last 30 to 40 years. And in fact, uh, there are hydros in Southeast Alaska that are still running on original equipment, not the generator, but turbine components still lasting for up to a hundred years. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's actually really low maintenance compared with like a fuel burning uh, generation system. No, that's interesting. 100 years is a long time. <laughs> um, and so other questions that we have is, can this be scaled up through transmission improvements through MEA? Scaled up? Well, um, yeah, let's see. Well, we would sort of have to do a redesign. Uh, we built the pipeline, the penstock, the turbine, the generator. That's all built to produce 300 kilowatts. And we did that because that's what the system can take. And for us to scale up to three phase power, uh, the cost of bringing a three phase power line up to our project would have been at least another half a million dollars. Uh, you know, so another 30% of our project costs. So um, we're not designed for that. Okay, got it. Um, did you approach uh, the Alaska Energy Authority, AEA at all about this project? Yeah, that's who we applied to uh, for the renewable energy grant funds. Those were administered by the AEA. They reviewed our applications both in 2012 and 2013, and we were denied. Okay. Um, so let's see, what other questions we have here? Um, could this type of, Jamie asks, could this type of project be scaled down and still be feasible? Oh, scaled down, absolutely. So there's small scale hydros available. You can purchase uh, package plants uh, that can take, uh, basically it'll, it'll come with a turbine generator, everything set up for a, pen, a pipe as small as two inches. So you can, you can buy these things, those size things off the shelf. Larger hydros like mine, uh, you know, even though it's, a micro or mini hydro. Um, there's a lot of design that goes into this. The penstock, the spillway, the penstock, the turbine, the generator, that's all specifically designed. The controls, it's all meant to work together. So it's the bigger you go, the more intricate the design becomes. But if you want to scale down to something small for your uh, for home use or uh, smaller production, uh, those systems are quite a bit simpler and, and much more economical. Okay. Um, what can Anchorage citizens do to make to help make renewable energy projects like this more of a priority in Alaska and with the MEA? Ah, with MEA. Well, you know, uh, gosh, if we had board members that supported this. I think, uh, you know, if we had board members that were actually pushing for a green power program that wanted it to happen, uh, I don't see why it couldn't happen. We sort of gave them everything we needed, the tariff and the numbers, and it was all there years ago. And it's the board members who 
you know, they're the ones who said the last thing we need is a dam project. So that's one thing, board, boards of utilities. Uh, another thing is um, voluntary green power program. If you think, you know, the unfortunate thing is that uh, our Alaska law, and in fact, the law throughout the country is that zero emissions doesn't have any value. There's no dollar value for clean energy. It's not, it's not worth any more. It's actually worth less than polluting energy because oftentimes polluting power plants, they get paid for capacity. We don't. So actually clean power here is actually worth less than dirty power. So that just needs to change. And, uh, you know, um, things have been attempted to happen in Congress, you know, four or five years ago that got reversed and Alaska was pulled out of it. And uh, we're there again now looking at what to do in Congress about valuing clean energy. And like I say, right now, especially in Alaska, it's not, clean power is not worth anything. It's not worth any more than dirty power. It's worth less. So, Bart, can I just jump in to piggyback on your question on, on that okay. question, last one to you, Dave, thank you. I just wanna say SRC is also doing a lot of work around uh, MEA utility election work and reform. Uh, we have specific programs um, that we're running, working on different aspects of MEA and making sure citizens are involved. And we've recently started working on MEA board elections because as you said, that's such an important thing. And so just, uh, in regards to that last question, I think um, people in the MEA district definitely need to vote. It's a super, super small percentage of um, the district. It's a huge district, right? The MEA whole region is is immense and uh, very small voter turnout. So I think if everyone on here got 10 of their friends to vote, we could flip many seats. Um, and also if people are interested in getting uh, volunteering around things like that or making donations specifically to help us do that work. Um, we uh, can both, do, uh, we can use you for in all of those aspects. And uh, additionally, like there's uh, various committees that people can be on that are starting to form with MEA that can help lead some of that direction, though MEA, the board is not great to uh, listening to their members <laughs> in all cases, uh, but we're working on changing that. And also, um, you know, board finding good board members is also a challenge. So there's a lots of uh, things people can do uh, from the citizen angle, because I, I do think that if people do uh, minimally vote in these elections, we can we can get a better a better board on there and change some of these policies from within. I hope so too. Um, there's another question from Facebook regarding MEA. Um, the cost structure with MEA seems like it's designed as a dis as a disincentive for renewable developers such as yourself. Are we understanding that correctly? Um, disincentive for, well, no, I think, I think the cost structure is agnostic as to technology. It's uh, basically um, avoided costs Anybody who can produce power for the same cost that MEA produces, uh, MEA is obligated to take the power for that cost. So it, it doesn't discriminate against us, uh, but it doesn't value, it doesn't value clean energy. That's like zero value. And then actually it does discriminate in, in the, by not paying us for capacity. So that, that does work against us. And their whole argument is that they have all the capacity they need. Um, MEA's got like 30% extra or current levels. And so they're never going to need anybody's capacity. They got all they want. Okay. Um, so a few more questions. George asks, is this an induction generator or some other type? Of generator that you're using? Uh, yeah, thank you. This is not in, there's two types, you know, induction, uh, is also called asynchronous. Um, and those induction generators need to be connected to the grid in order to generate. Uh, they basically push against the grid. 
Uh, mine is not an induction generator, it's a synchronous generator. So we can run the generator by itself without being connected to the grid. Okay. Um, another question from George is, what is output voltage of the generator before step up? to the MEA primary line. Yeah, yeah, so the, the generator puts out 480 volts and then it's stepped up uh, to transmission voltage, subdivision voltage is 7,200. So we start at 480 and it goes up to 7,200 through a transformer. Okay. Um, well, I'm also curious, um, so there was engineering involved in the production of this site, but there was also engineering to get all the pieces there. And how many people were on that team? How many minds were working <laughs> on this? <laughs> oh yeah, good question. Lots of guys. Um, uh, of course, uh, you know we had uh, the helicopter company. Uh, we had uh, equipment fabricators who built these uh, custom trailer to carry the 8,000 pound generator down the hill, down this, uh, you know, 400 vertical feet down a steep mountain trail behind an excavator. So we had those fabricators uh, from Anchorage, a couple of different ones. Uh, we had civil engineers from uh, Polar Consult here in Anchorage, uh, did all my civil engineering. Uh, we also had geotechnical engineers, power line engineers, switchgear engineers, et cetera. Got it. Um, and then it took how long, again, just to reiterate how long it took you, how many years was this project in the works? Yeah, so it was, you know, I suppose right around a decade from when I started measuring flow on the creek uh, and, uh, you know, which was before uh, we had to develop enough data to apply for the 2012 uh, and 2013 renewable energy grant application. So I did flow measurements, yeah, probably beginning in 2010, 2011. We applied for the grants in 2012, 2013. We started gauging the stream in earnest in 2014. Uh, and that's one of the things, you know, these energy projects take a long time. So it, it kind of, it seems crazy to me that we talk about, oh, we're going to change our, you know, we're going to reduce emissions by 2030. We're going to change everything around by 2035. It's like, you know, things take, I, we're talking about proven technology here. My hydroelectric is one of the older technologies. It's very well proven. Canyon Hydro has been making these turbines for 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, it still takes at least 10 years to bring one of these online, 10 years of planning and evaluation and and, uh, you know, that's where you need these costs forecasting. You need some, you need reliability in forecasting. And that's why there hasn't been any development of renewables here in Alaska. It's like, there is no reliable forecast and there is no commitment to support these kinds of projects. Well, probably just one or two more questions here. I feel like we could probably ask questions for the rest of the evening. Um, but you were talking about the dippers on the creek. Did you have to do any other environmental feasibility studies prior to a project like this, um, looking at the plants or anything like that? Um, or was the primary concern salmon? Um, well, the permits that we got uh, included permits, of course, from the municipality, which, you know, like the big boys there were the conditional use permits and the uh, uh, exemptions from Title 21, our land use code. And we had to get four different variances from Title 21 having to do with stream setbacks, uh, steep slope. Uh, you know, Title 21 prohibits you from building anything within 50 or 100 feet of a stream. You can't disturb any slope steeper than uh, 26 degrees. Um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has a process of uh, evaluating projects like this for impacts on environment. Uh, it's circulated around to all the resource agencies. They all comment on, on the FERC application. 
Um, and of course, uh, the uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game weighed in heavily on this. They came and visited the site uh, and actually determined there was no fish presence um, and therefore I didn't need a fish habitat permit. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think the various, uh, uh, the big ones were probably FERC and conditional use and um, the Title 21 uh, variances. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity there for resource agencies to bring up problems um, and ask us to address them. And we did, uh, there were problems we needed to address such as noise and vibration. What would that impact be on the on the surrounding subdivision? All those types of concerns. Um, we pretty much fielded all those. Okay, great. Um, do you have time? We have a few more questions. If you if you don't mind going over a little bit here. Um, sure. Great. Um, one is from Tyler. Dave mentioned applying for water rights. What was involved with that process? Yeah, water rights, uh, you have to measure your stream flow, of course, uh, and um, find out how much water's there first, obviously. Uh, and DNR, so DNR administers the water rights program, and they typically require five years of stream flow data before they will accept a water rights application. Uh, and so that's where I showed you the graph of stream flows over that period of years. We started in 2014, and we actually did lots of correlations with other streams uh, in the area with correlations with Eagle River, correlations with Ship Creek, and we were able to show that our stream actually matches, correlates pretty well with Ship Creek, which has, a, has one of the longest stream flow records in Alaska. They've got over 70 years of record for Ship Creek. So um, we were able to use that information to sort of bolster our, our, uh, our water rights application. But yeah, there's a, there's a process and you, basically you gotta get out there and start measuring water flow for three to five years before you can even apply. And what is, I mean, is that a daily measurement or is that we, weekly, monthly, what, it, what is that? Um... Yeah, um, usually for stream flow, uh, we install gauges that has, basically it's a little device you put in the water and uh, it records the water level. <clears throat> uh, in my case, every 15 minutes, I put in four stream gauges um, at different locations and it records the water level every 15 minutes. And then we use that rating curve that I showed you to translate your flow measurements um, using those to calculate stream flow. So um, yeah, you use these little devices in the stream and they measure the, the water flow pretty much continuously. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, do you have anything else that you would like to add just to cap off your presentation? Well, uh, yeah, I feel uh, I didn't mean to be a complainer uh, in this in this presentation, but I feel like, you know, this is it's sort of a feel good story because we were successful. I mean, we got this done and uh, I'm happy and proud and uh, that I can pass this on to my children and it's going to benefit other people after I'm gone and uh, I feel good about that so that's kind of a feel good story but and that's that's sort of the story that uh, Alex Demarban who wrote the article in the Anchorage Daily News about us he he did a very good job of, of showing the positive light of this and I thank him for that um, but I feel like people also got to hear well uh, things aren't quite right and we need to do something to make things better. So I guess that would be my, my apology for, for complaining a little bit. No, it's, I, it's really nice to hear the success story and the proof of concept, but how our, our system is failing us a little bit and how that actually gets implemented for, for other projects. Um, so thank you for sharing the negatives as well as the successes. It's important to hear. All right, well, um, I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you so much, Dave, for um, willing to meet tonight and to give us all a presentation. Um, it was incredibly interesting and I feel like we could ask questions for the rest of the evening, but we've already gone over. Um,
thank you so much everyone for um, attending this evening. Uh, there will be a recording of this on YouTube as well as on Facebook Live. We have some other great events coming up in November. Um, we'll be celebrating Creativity in the Watershed with a virtual paint and sip, two virtual art shows, and then kicking off um, the Wild Sioux Feast. So keep, um, keep your eyes peeled for those events. And thank you so much, Dave. Really appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.